I wonder uh, the impact that you saw that happening, that having within Norwegian society, and the impact of that on you, particularly as you moved into the role of NATO Secretary General. The impact on Norway was, I think, that in one way we lost our innocence because we, we thought that this uh, was uh, uh, something that couldn't happen in Norway. Terrorism, terrorist attacks was something that could happen in other countries, but not in Norway. And then suddenly it happened in Norway, and it not only happened in Norway, but the scale and the scope of that <laughs> terrorist attack is one of the biggest in Europe over many, many years. Uh, so, of course, if you measure the number of casualties is much bigger what happened here, but if you measure against other terrorist attacks in Europe or against the size of the Norwegian population, five million, then this, is, this was really something really big, really awful, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, also the character of the violence shocked us all. Uh, the strength was, uh, and what I think impressed was all was the way the Norwegian people reacted. Uh, because instead of hatred and, and in a way, revenge, it was about tolerance, democracy, openness, uh, to guard those principles and those values that uh, were under attack. And, um, and uh, there were many expressions of that, but uh, one of the strongest expressions of what was what we call these, the rose uh, marches, or um, hundreds of thousands of people walking out in the streets uh, expressing their support for open and free uh, uh, Norwegian society. And, and, and we, I think we have been able to maintain a high level of trust and openness uh, in, in Norway. Um, um, uh, then you asked me... Uh, uh, About the Secretary General's yeah, role. And to be honest, it has been extremely useful. Uh, uh, perhaps that's the wrong thing to say, but, uh, but I think that for me it is useful to have been so close to a terrorist attack. Uh, because uh, when I came to NATO, of course, uh, it was about a more assertive Russia, Ukraine, and the challenges in the East. But I came to, uh, to NATO when we really had to step up in the fight against Daesh, uh, ISIS, in Iraq, Syria, uh, when we saw many uh, serious terrorist attacks in our own streets, in, in Paris, in Brussels, uh, uh, in London, and, and elsewhere. So terrorism uh, came very high on uh, my agenda. And I met and I talked to many political leaders in all the NATO allies who suffered terrorist attacks. And for me to be able to share with them the experience, the importance of unite against our values. I remember, for instance, we marched in the streets of Paris, uh, many political leaders from, from European countries and, uh, and elsewhere. And that was not the same as the Rose March, marches in Oslo, but it was something similar people going out in the streets saying that we don't want to be intimidated, we don't, to be, we don't want to be um, scared, we want to protect the, uh, the normal life of, a, of people living in Paris, going to cafes, living normal lives. So uh, it has been an advantage for me to have my experience from Norway when I discuss uh, uh, these issues with uh, political leaders uh, in other NATO allied uh, uh, countries uh, as Secretary General Let me ask, um, you speak uh, about the importance of values and these are what underpin NATO. Um, you talk about these efforts to remember is also a matter of remembering who we are. And yet I wonder if uh, you find, given the political turmoil in many countries, uh, the tensions within all kinds of societies, do you think that we, whoever we are, do we still agree on what our values are, or is there something fundamentally uh, being contested right now? Fundamentally, I think we uh, agree and understand the value of open, of open free uh, societies, so again, depending a bit on who we are. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and at least I think there is, a, there is a, 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 and as soon as those values are under real threat, at least we understand how uh, important they are. Uh, either under real threat from, uh, from terrorist organizations, from, from terrorist uh, threats, or from uh, uh, governments or adversaries. Uh, so I think the danger is that sometimes when you take these values for granted, you uh, forget, or we, it's easy to forget how important it is to, to uphold them and to uh, uh, defend them. Uh, then I think that what we have to admit is that 
sometimes we have different views on how we best, best protect them and actually how, how we practice these values in the best possible way. Uh, and this is of course a bit sensitive because this is also a discussion inside the alliance. Uh, but uh, fundamentally I think that uh, uh, there is a broad understanding of the value of open free societies and the main response from uh, NATO allies when they are under uh, terrorist attack is to unite around those values. Um, you uh, spoke about uh, the challenges that the alliance faces and I wanted to turn immediately to the question of Russia and mm. obviously uh, Russia is an adversary, if that's the right word, mm. to uh, the United States, of course, to uh, the NATO alliance. Uh, describe, if you would, the strategy that you see the Russians um, putting into play here, whether it's in terms of uh, military efforts or in terms of efforts to undermine the confidence of societies in the values you've just described. So what we see is a more assertive Russia, and Russia use, uh, uses both the tools you mentioned. They, they use military efforts, military capabilities. We have seen that uh, in Ukraine, uh, illegally annexed in Crimea. We have seen it, for instance, in Syria, where they uh, also provide as a strong and, 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 and very powerful support for the Assad regime uh, with military means. But they also use uh, what we call hybrid uh, techniques or tactics, which is, you know, more covert uh, 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 tools or, or, or activities, uh, meddling in political uh, processes in different member states and partner <coughs> nations of, uh, of NATO, um, uh, disinformation and propaganda, uh, and the whole thing is that the whole, uh, if one NATO ally is under attack, armed attack, then we trigger the Article 5 and, and we defend each other. And we have done a lot of the recent years to improve our capability to do exactly that. The challenge now is that we are challenged uh, what we, with what we call uh, as a tools or activities below Article 5. So it's not so serious, not so visible, not so uh, 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 overt that we can react by invoking Article 5. Uh, for instance, disinformation. Uh, we saw the Skripal case. We saw recently Greece expelled uh, some Russian officials that were that were meddling in the political process in Greece related to the name agreement between Greece and and the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. Very important issue in that part of Europe. Uh, so NATO has to be able to respond both to an armed attack, which is something we have prepared for and planned for for 70 years, but we also need to be able to respond to something which is below uh, a full armed attack. And that's about intelligence, that's about uh, 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 um, uh, cyber, uh, improving our cyber uh, defenses, uh, that's about also meeting the disinformation and the propaganda. And that's part about NATO providing facts uh, and countering some of the disinformation which is out there, or helping member states to do so. But I think one of the most important things we do uh, to counter disinformation and propaganda is to stand up for a free and open press, or free and open media. Because at the end of the day, it has to be the media, uh, journalists, that ask uh, the difficult questions, that check their sources, and, and, and are able to discover when another state tries to meddle in political uh, processes in one or another uh, NATO ally. Uh, this meddling in the political processes is said to be part of the Russian strategy, Putin's strategy, to essentially put a wedge into the alliance so that some members become weaker. And as we say, uh, you're only as strong as your weakest link. Um, would you agree with that assessment? And do you think he has, uh, or the Russians, have made uh, headway in that regard? Um, I, I think as Russia tries to divide us. Russia is don't like NATO. That's in a way. It's a, is a, and that, that's fair enough. They, they disagree with us. They don't like the idea that uh, we stand together. Uh, and uh, and, uh, and that's, a, that's a Russian po uh, position. Um, and of course, they would uh, regard it as a great success if they were able to divide us. Um, and to be honest, we see uh, some divisions within allies uh, or within, between allies. Uh, not only you know, in, initiated by Russia, but for different reasons, we see differences between uh, NATO allies. Um, what I say when I'm confronted with that is that NATO is an alliance of 29 democracies uh, on both sides of the Atlantic, 
and there has been and there will be differences between uh, different independent nations with different culture, different history, uh, different political parties in government, so there will, will be differences. The strength of NATO is that we, despite these differences, have, uh, we have always been able to unite around our core task, and that is to protect and defend each other. So as long as we are able to continue to do that, we can live with differences. Actually, differences, open the discussions, disagreements, it's not always a sign of weakness, it's very often a sign of strength, as long as we are able to unite around our core task. And I'm afraid this answer is a bit long, but let me add that now, please. <laughs> because sometimes we forget that we have seen uh, serious disagreements between NATO allies before. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I watch the uh, TV series The Crown, so I learn a lot from that. TV series are very, <laughs> don't tell anyone, but it's very useful to watch. Uh, and uh, one, of the, one of the episodes there uh, is about, you know, the Suez crisis, uh -huh. which was a big crisis in, uh, in the relationship between US uh, and, uh, and, and France and, 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 and United Kingdom. Uh, they went into military action against Egypt and the United States was against, and it was really a bad uh, it really created a really bad uh, relationship between uh, the United States and two main uh, European NATO allies. And, it, yeah, and even had to, yeah, it was a political crisis in the in, in, in UK. Well, we con that was during the coldest period of the Cold War. And NATO continued to deliver deterrence and defense despite the Suez crisis. Ten years later, we, you know, NATO used to have its headquarters not in Brussels, but in Paris. And I've seen the beautiful building where the, where the NATO headquarters used to be with a view to the Eiffel Tower and, and we had both our civilian headquarters and our military headquarters in Brussels. Then in 67, uh, the relationship between President Johnson and, and President de Gaulle uh, turned uh, not so very constructive, so, uh, so we just had to leave. And we left. And I was not attending NATO meetings at that time, but I guess the meetings were not uh, the best atmosphere you have seen. And then, some years later, we disagreed on the Iraq War. Some allies were heavily involved in the Iraq War, 2003. Other allies were strongly against. We have overcome, we have been able to overcome all these differences and disagreements um, uh, and still be the most successful, the strongest alliance uh, in history, protecting each other. So, um, we cannot guarantee that NATO will always uh, be able to overcome disagreements, but at least we have proven that we are able to do it. And my ambition, why, my task, my responsibility is to make sure that despite the differences we see, we should be able to do it also in the future. Thank you. Um, speaking of uh, some differences, uh, there's been talk about the contribution of various NATO members to uh, the budgets of their own militaries and therefore to the alliance. Uh, I wonder if you could speak about um, the NATO response to uh, the President's comments about this, and also, uh, in relation to that, whether you think um, the bottom line of budget contributions is the way to assess the value of the alliance. First, um, NATO allies have agreed to invest more in defense, not to please the United States but because it is in our own security interest to uh, strengthen our collective defense. Uh, then, in addition, when European allies and Canada invest more, we also contribute to a fairer burden sharing within the alliance, which I think is fair because the burden sharing now is imbalanced. Uh, the GDP uh, of uh, the gross national, uh, the gross domestic product of, of, of the United States is approximately as big as uh, uh, gross domestic product of uh, uh, European uh, NATO allies. Despite that, the US spends more than twice as much on defense. So therefore we have agreed that those who are spending less than 2% of GDP on defense should uh, increase and reach the 2% guideline. Um, the good news is that that's exactly what the European allies have started to do. Uh, they still have a, they have a long way to go, but after years of cutting or declines in defense budgets, we now see an increase. Uh, last year we had the biggest increase in defense spending since the end of the Cold War, more than 5%. And just over the two last years we had more than 41 billion extra US dollar, uh, dollars from Canada and the United States invested in, in defense. Um, um, 
then uh, so 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 uh, so so I agree we need the fair burden sharing. I uh, we and the good news is that we are we have started to deliver on that. Um, uh, uh, and, uh, and but still we have a long way to go. Oh, oh. In 2014, when we made this decision, it was actually only three allies that met the 2% guideline. Uh, this year we expect eight allies to uh, meet the 2% guideline, and, all, and even those who are below are, have started to, to move towards the 2% guideline, so it's going in the right direction. Then you asked me whether defense spending is the only way to measure it. No, of course not. Uh, uh, NATO is a political and military alliance. Uh, we need to deliver uh, military strength, collective defense, but we need also to deliver uh, political efforts, diplomatic efforts. Uh, I'm strongly in favor of dialogue with Russia, for instance, to try to, try to defuse tensions, to, to avoid a new arms race. Uh, so we have many other tasks than just deliver military uh, strength. Um, and, and let me also add that I'm not all. I was Minister of Finance back in, in, in the 1990s in Norway, and I was able to cut defence budgets. I'm really good at that. I know exactly how, <laughs> how to do it. Uh, and uh, it's just to contrast military spending with healthcare, and then, oh. So, so uh, I know, and I'm, and I'm not ashamed of that, because the thing is that it's possible to reduce defence spending when tensions are going down. And after the end of the Cold War, after the Berlin, uh, the, the, uh, the Berlin Wall came down and, and the Warsaw Pact was dissolved, then it was actually rash, ra the right thing to do to cut the, or, or reduce defense spending. So you can do that when tensions are going down as long as you're able to increase defense spending when tensions are going up, as they are uh, now, doing now. So therefore, uh, uh, yeah, therefore I'm now a strong advocate for increased investments in defense. You mentioned uh, Afghanistan in your remarks, and it's uh, 17 years uh, that uh, combat has been underway there with the United States and its NATO allies. In this country, certainly, there is a sense of, does this ever end? Are we going to be there forever? Because we've been there the longest military engagement we've had. Um, what do you see as the end game in <coughs> Afghanistan? And this uh, debate in the US that I've mentioned about whether we should continue this commitment. Do you see that debate being duplicated in some of the NATO countries that have been there for so long as well? So as we have been there for 17 years, and I think it's fair and right to ask questions about uh, whether it's right to continue. Uh, because we should not con only continue just because we have been there. We need, we need a deliberate uh, uh, decision. We need uh, some real... Uh, uh, assessments uh, uh, about uh, whether to stay or not uh, before we make our decisions. Um, and we have done that, and we need, of course, also to continue to do that. Uh, but the conclusion has been that we should stay. Uh, 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 because, uh, for, uh, mainly because we, uh, th there, are, there are high costs related to staying in Afghanistan. Uh, we have uh, more than 16,000 NATO troops there uh, in a train assist and advice mission. Uh, it's a high financial cost and it's a political cost and of course it is a, a human cost. We still have some casualties. But when you compare the cost of staying with the cost of leaving, our conclusion is that the cost of leaving is higher. Because if we leave Afghanistan, I think we have to be prepared for that Taliban will, become, will come back, uh, and ISIS is in Afghanistan, and they will try to re-establish the caliphate they lost in Iraq and Syria, they will re-establish in, uh, in, in Afghanistan. So that's the most likely outcome if we leave. So then if we leave, we have to be prepared to, to stay out of Afghanistan, even though Afghanistan once again becomes a safe haven for international terrorists. And they start to train, uh, organize, plan, finance terrorist attacks on our own countries from Afghanistan. And if, and if, uh, and if we were able to promise ourselves that despite that we will not go back, then it's possible to leave. But I don't think we will, we, will, we, will not, we will not be willing to watch that happen. So then we will leave, stay out for some years and be forced back again. And that's the worst possible alternative. Um, uh, and we have to remember that the reason why we are in Afghanistan is very much because of what happened here. We have to remember that, uh, not NATO, because NATO was not present as an alliance, but uh, 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 NATO allies left Iraq in 2011. 
Then a few years later, we were all back. All of us, from the left to the right, everyone. So I was against the Iraq war in 2003. All those um, politicians I know that was against the Iraq war in 2003, they were in favor of going back now. So it's only if you really believe that we are willing to stay out and watch ISIS Khorasan, which is the Afghan branch of ISIS, take over and say, no, no, just continue, we'll not go back, then you can leave. So I'm um, back to my main point. There is no easy way out. There is no easy solution. There is no solution in Afghanistan without costs. But the cost of leaving is, uh, best of my best, best judgment, higher than the cost of staying. Add to that, that our presence in Afghanistan now is totally different than what is was, was than different from from what it was at the beginning, because for many years we had a big combat operation in Afghanistan, where we had more than 100,000 troops, and when there was a Taliban attack, it was uh, U.S. forces or uh, Danish forces or Norwegian forces that went out, and responded to the Taliban attack. Now it's the Afghans themselves; they go out, they are in the front line. We help them, we train them, we fund them, but we have gone from more than 100,000 troops in the combat operation to 16,000 troops in the train, assist, and advice mission. US do some counterterrorism on top of that, but still, it's a totally different presence, and, uh, and therefore a much more enduring and, and, and sustainable uh, presence. And that's the reason why I said in my speech that prevention is better than intervention. The best thing we can do to fight international terrorism is to train local forces, as we have done in Afghanistan, and, 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 and help them. The last thing about Afghanistan, it is really serious. I mean, the Taliban is there, ISIS is there, uh, many different terrorist groups are there. Uh, uh, so I'm not saying that this is a straightforward, easy way, but I'm saying that the alternative is worse. Let me follow up on that because, um, you know, <coughs> implicit in your remarks that if we go, the Taliban will succeed, it casts some question about the effectiveness of the training operation, mm. how long this will go on, and whether or not under any circumstances and under any length of time it can be effective. So how do you assess the effectiveness of that mission and whether or not at some point uh, there will be a possibility of a further reduction of NATO troops, if not a complete withdrawal? Um, I think that if there's any lesson we uh, have learned from Afghanistan is that we should have started the training and the capacity building earlier. Um, uh, uh, but we have at least succeeded in building and train uh, uh, Afghan forces and, uh, uh, and uh, the police, which are now, also, they are able to hold uh, uh, the main cities, the ground uh, in most of the provinces in Afghanistan. Again, it's not easy, but for instance, the, the stated uh, goal of Taliban this year was to take control over one of the provincial capitals. They have not succeeded in that. Taliban controls territory in Afghanistan. They, they pose a, a, a constant threat, uh, but uh, at least uh, uh, we have some, uh, we have the Afghan uh, army and, and, and security forces uh, being in the front line, uh, being responsible for security in, in their own country. Well, um, um, the, uh, the aim, uh, the, 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 the way to leave Afghanistan uh, is, to find, is to be able to reach a political solution. And therefore we strongly support uh, the bold and new initiatives by President Ghani to really engage in a political peace process with Taliban. The US is also engaging uh, now in political process or peace uh, efforts with Taliban. And, uh, and uh, Hopefully that can lead to something. I don't think that it, we will ever see Afghanistan, you know, as stable and as peaceful as, you know, our own countries, but at least that we can come in a situation where it's responsible to leave. We will not stay longer in Afghanistan than necessary, but we will stay as long as it's needed to prevent Afghanistan from once again becoming a safe haven for international uh, terrorists. And we are staying there now to also send a clear message to the Taliban that they will not win on the battlefield, so they have to sit down at the negotiating table and then reach a political compromise with the uh, uh, government in Kabul. Let me ask, as Secretary General, you obviously get a very strong sense of the impact of uh, the fighting in Afghanistan on the different uh, partner militaries. 
the two questions, and these have been raised in relation to the United States military and its role in fighting both Afghanistan and Iraq. One, certainly the capacities to fight this kind of war seem to have improved. Uh, and so there is a more effective way of doing this, it seems, over time. On the other hand, it takes you away from, in the case of NATO, what the core business is, which is the defense of Europe and certainly the original idea of this Soviet-Russian threat. Mm. So how would you assess the impact on the militaries that have been in Afghanistan for these 17 years uh, in these two senses? Um, I think that uh, what happened after 9-11 uh, and when NATO started and um, well, actually started to happen a bit before because it started when we went into uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina and, uh, and Kosovo, very different, but at least we started then to have military operations out of area. And uh, for people who are, uh, who are as old as I am, I remember that in the 80s, uh, it was a big discussion whether NATO should go out of area, meaning go out of the, so have any military presence outside uh, NATO allied uh, territory. Um, and while we had this more theoretical debate, uh, uh, we suddenly saw the Berlin Wall came down and uh, people started to ask, do we need uh, NATO anymore? Because the reason why we existed was in the Soviet Union, the Warsaw Pact, and, and that just disappeared. And then people said that NATO either had to go out of area, as meaning beyond NATO territory, or out of business. And we went not out of business, but out of area. First, uh, uh, helping to end two wars in the Balkans, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Kosovo, uh, Serbia, and then later on Afghanistan and fighting piracy and, and elsewhere. What that did with our armed forces is that we transformed our armed forces from more static, collective defense, heavy armor, heavy troops, uh, uh, high-end capabilities uh, in Europe, uh, to more light expeditionary forces in the mountains of, of Afghanistan. And that's a totally different concept, to, to, totally different equipment, totally different training. Uh, so we transformed it from collective defense in Europe to expeditionary uh, forces able to deploy uh, uh, quickly all over the world or uh, far away. And it also inter, uh, increased what we call interoperability because we had, for the first time in our history, then troops from different NATO allies and partner countries really working together in military operations. NATO had not fired one single shot uh, before we went beyond uh, NATO territory into the Balkans and later in Afghanistan. So that's, that's in a way, that developed our military capabilities. The challenge was that it weakened our ability to, for, uh, to do the, tra the traditional collective defense in Europe. For, as I said, one of my good reasons, because tensions went down, we didn't see Russia as a real challenge any anymore, so we could <coughs> divert our resources to, some, to something else. The challenge now is that we have to go back to do more collective defense, more the old as a traditional uh, deterrence defense in Europe, uh, with armor, with heavy equipment, with all that. But at the same time, we need to continue to manage crisis beyond our borders. So. For 40 years, NATO did only one thing, that was collective defense in Europe, from 49 to 89. Then for 25 years, we reduced our as I say, focus on collective defense. We were an expeditionary alliance doing something far away. Now, we have to continue to be far away in operations like Afghanistan and to do collective defense in Europe at the same time. So for the first time in NATO's history, we need to do crisis management uh, and collective defense at the same time. And that's the big transformation of NATO which has taken place over the last four or five years um, uh, and which we have so far successfully been able to, 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 to implement. Thank you. Uh, we're going to uh, take a couple of questions um, and we have uh, seated a couple uh, in the audience. We have, uh, our, as you know, uh, students from the High School of Economics and Finance and the Urban Assembly School for Emergency Management. Uh, and we've asked, uh, those schools each to prepare a question. So I'm going to call first on Jessica. Where are you, Jessica? Somewhere. There you are. Please stand up. You'll take the microphone and uh, ask a question, please, for the Secretary General. What do you think your challenges are for the next 10 to 15 years? 
I, you know, I, I think it's very hard to predict uh, because all those people who are in the business of predicting, they are normally totally wrong. Uh, uh, yeah, they, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, in one way, it's a big surprise how many people can have, that can have so many exams and PhDs and uh, in so many different uh, uh, fields and they are always wrong. Um, That's very reassuring. No, no, but... <laughs> Not always, but at least they are not very clever at predicting the future. Uh, and I was, I started, uh, I, I worked for two years in the Central Bureau of Statistics in Norway, and then I worked together with some people that were predicting oil prices. That was a total catastrophe. <laughs> <laughs> we were, and, and, and we actually, what we started to do, and, and now we have done that for some years, in, because we are very dependent on oil prices in Norway, and we have started to do something I think which is very interesting. We're looking backwards, and then we compare our predictions 5, 10, 20 years ago with what actually happened and it illustrates that there's a totally gap, a big gap. The reality is that when prices are going up, we predict they will continue to go up. And when going down, we predict they will continue to go down. <laughs> Approximately something like that. Uh, but we pay a lot for all this analysis. When it, but, but then you have social sciences, so as an economist, we know mathematics and we have models and so on, but we are still wrong. Uh, on the oil prices. Not always wrong, but I mean oil prices. Uh, 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 you know, I remember a debate in Norway with some experts on foreign uh, and security issues. The spring 89. And I, won't, I will not mention the names of those experts because that will be <laughs> an insult. They were sitting there and they were asked, do you think the Berlin Wall can come down? No, no, no. No way. Per, yeah, perestroika and Gasnos, that's possible, that would change uh, Russia and, as the Soviet Union, but the Berlin Wall, that will still, uh, uh, it, it, it will stand. Then months later, it just went down. And then the same experts are experts in explaining why it went down. <laughs> <laughs> and we pay them for that too. <laughs> so, they're good at businesses also, yeah. <laughs> And then, and then, and then uh, the, uh, the Arab Spring or 9/11. I mean, when when we when we in NATO had uh, you know an, analyzed what kind of threats and challenges we were going to face, not many people were able to predict 9/11. And if you asked experts, as I was not going around in NATO, but I think very much that if you asked experts back, back in 2001, when will be or before 9/11, what will be the first case when NATO invokes Article 5? No one would have said a terrorist attack on the United States. The whole idea with Article 5 was to defend European allies against uh, uh, Soviet Union uh, sending their battle tanks over something called the Fulda Gap in, the, in, in Germany. So, uh, the reason why I say all this is that when you hear people start to predict what will happen in 10, 15 years, you should always be very suspicious. But, yeah, so thank you. No, no. But, Here but, we go. Yeah, yeah, but, but then, so, but, but what you can do is to be prepared for the unforeseen, to have a strategy to deal with surprises, to have a strategy to deal with uncertainty. And what we did in Norway was that we, we were less focused on our ability to predict all prices because we were always wrong about that. But we developed a strategy to how to deal with fluctuations in oil prices and fluctuation in oil revenues. So we invented a pension fund, which is a beautiful thing in Norway. Um, <laughs> yeah. so, so then, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying it doesn't matter, but since we're not able to predict uh, also 10, 15 years about the oil price, we created a mechanism to deal with uncertainty. And that's exactly the same we have to do when it comes to security. That I cannot tell you exactly what will be the main challenge or the main threat or the main something in 10, 15 years. But I can tell you that if we stand together, if we have a strong transatlantic bond, North America and Europe together, then we are much more capable of dealing with those threats, challenges, whatever they may be. And that if we have capable forces, uh, high readiness, good intelligence, uh, 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 situational awareness, then we can deal with short-term and long-term uh, surprises. So instead of now listing, all, so we have a more sort of Russia, we have terrorism, we have cyber, it's easy to list a lot of potential things. 
that may or may not happen. My focus is less on trying to predict that, because I will not be able to do so. More, more on how to be able to react, to deal with, uh, and manage if uh, and when uh, surprises uh, happen. Thank you. Uh, also, uh, speaking of uncertainty and preparing for it, we have a question from Emmanuel from the Urban Assembly School for Emergency Management. So where is Emmanuel? Please stand up. Thank you. Your friends are with you. <laughs> So you said that it can be difficult to tell what the main issues or like the main problems you might face in the future are. So just to narrow that down, what effects do you think the current US administration will have on NATO in the future? We like the best for last. Yeah, no, but, <laughs> no, but, but I think what, what we see now is that, is that, well, we are an alliance of 29 different nations with uh, different political leaders, with different political opinions about many things. And we also see that there are some serious disagreements uh, uh, between different NATO allies, but also sometimes between the US and, and other NATO allies. On important issues as trade, tariffs, uh, the Paris Climate Accord, uh, the Iran nuclear deal, and other issues. And uh, my, my, my strategy or my, my, my response to that is that, well, the best thing would be if we were able to solve those disagreements on trade, on climate change. But as long as we are not able to solve these disagreements on trade tariffs, climate, whatever, then it is my and NATO's responsibility to make sure that those disagreements doesn't undermine the core of the transatlantic partnership that we protect and defend each other. So, 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 so meaning that, yes, there are differences, but so far, and uh, I really believe that we will be able to do that also in the, in the future, we have been able to maintain the security cooperation. Meaning that what we see now is actually that the United States is not redrawing its presence or reducing its presence in Europe, but actually the United States is increasing its military presence in Europe. For the first time uh, after many, many years uh, when the United States actually reduced its presence, the United States is now increasing its military presence in uh, Europe. So, so actions speak louder than words. Um, uh, the US uh, have more troops, more exercises. They recently just announced some more, more, more troops to Germany, uh, more pre-positioned uh, equipment. Even in Norway, they now, uh, the US have now some Marines. So, those who question the security relationship between Europe and, and, and North America, my answer to them is that no, actually we deliver. We had a successful summit where we made more than 100 concrete decisions on higher readiness, on new command structure, on reforming NATO, on a new training mission in Iraq. So actually we decided that North America and Europe should do more together, not less. And the US is proving that by what they actually do on the ground in, uh, in, in Europe. So. Um, I'm not absolutely certain what you asked me about, but the thing is that no, but the thing is that you, there, 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 are, there are differences, and and, and, and and we saw that also during the general debate in the UN yesterday that there are differences on issues between uh, NATO allies uh, uh, and also with uh, uh, with the United States and President Trump, but uh, but we have proven that we are able to um, to maintain and not only maintain but strengthen the cooperation within uh, NATO. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so that was, I would just add one thing which is not related to this, but I think it's important for me to say it about Russia. Because we are responding to Russia. Uh, we're not mirroring exactly uh, plane by plane or, or uh, tank by tank or whatever uh, what Russia does, but we are responding to the, uh, to the actions of Russia in Ukraine, in Georgia and elsewhere. But we are not, but, but, when we, but we want to avoid the new Cold War. We want to avoid a new arms race, and we are striving for a better relationship with Russia. Uh, and I strongly believe in dialogue with Russia, because Russia is there to stay. Russia is our neighbor, and we need to find a way to live with Russia. We will all be losers if we move into a new Cold War. And therefore, the strategy of NATO towards Russia is what we call deterrence, defense, and dialogue. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, I met with the Secretary, uh, no, Minister Lavrov yesterday, 
and uh, we disagree on many issues, for instance Ukraine, but we agree on the need for political dialogue between NATO and Russia because we need to uh, diffuse tension. Okay. Thank you.